CBI Television, First News. Good evening. It's one of the most spectacular fires in Prince Albert's history, and it's still smoldering at this hour. The Harp Hill apartment block on 10th Street East near the downtown was a towering inferno this evening. Our coverage tonight begins with this report from Susan Burton. Flames were already shooting out a second-story window by the time fire crews arrived at the Harp Hill apartments around 4 o'clock. Three adults and two children stood huddling in their shirt sleeves outside. They told reporters the fire started in the bedroom of their apartment. One floor up and two doors down, another family was trapped. A young boy tried in vain to break a window while firefighters tried to reach them, but the ladder was too short. An adult in the room finally managed to break the window, and that gave firefighters enough time to get into the building and rescue them. We've transported three people to the hospital with smoke inhalation. Uh, they're, all three of them are in the Holy Family Hospital right now. The ladder truck was called in to rescue another man from the fourth floor fire escape. It's too smoky. I tried. I just got choked right now. Did you hear any alarms go off? How did you know no. there was a fire? Well, I looked out there and opened the door. Shortly after Cush's escape, the fire was out of control. All firefighters could do was try to stop it from spreading. Homeowners to the east of the blaze tried to protect their property. By 6 o'clock, they were told to leave. By 7, the entire south side of the structure was gutted. The flames were rapidly consuming the entire building. Less than three weeks ago, the Harp Hill Apartments were identified as a potential fire trap by the city fire department. It may be hours or even days before it's known whether or not everyone got out of the building, and they may never know what caused the blaze. Susan Burton, First News, Prince Albert. It's far too early to even begin to estimate the financial damage. Those details will come out in the days ahead. But tonight, that doesn't seem too important. What is so painfully evident during these first few hours is the human tragedy. Jamie Killingsworth has that story. I got no home though. There are about 40 apartments in the building. All the people who lived here are now homeless. While firefighters fought the flames, the Salvation Army fanned out, trying to find those left homeless by the blaze. Sam Roberts got out with nothing but the clothes on his back. What can you do? When there's a fire, move. Fortunately for Roberts, he has friends he can stay with. Charles Servan was also left homeless by the fire. He too has a place to stay. Servan lives on the ground floor and is lucky to be alive. I come here, I rentre, I rentre 3.30, there was no fire. I go out and then I 10 minutes and I come back, the fire was already on in the window. As the fire raged on, there was a fear it might spread, putting other homes in jeopardy. Deborah Palmer and her family live just three houses down from the inferno a home they bought just eight months ago. Well, Mom, it's not going to it. As firefighters moved into backyards in an effort to contain the blaze, Palmer became more anxious. Oh, I'm just going to wait for a little bit longer, and if it starts moving as it looks like it might, I think we'll start taking a few things. All the family could do now was wait and hope. There were a few nervous hours, but firefighters seemed to have things under control, and that means Deborah Palmer's home is safe. Until it's totally out, I'm still going to house. I'm kind of concerned because there's always stray sparks. But uh, even if the bricks fall, the worst they can do is hit the power lines. Powers have been out. We've got no power, so I guess it can't hurt too much. Well, I was quite worried. I was wondering, <laughs> i got to get all my clothes out of the house. Not everyone was this fortunate. Those left homeless lost everything. Well, and did you manage to save any of your possessions? <laughs> just, just what I'm wearing. It will be a long time before those devastated by this tragedy can begin to rebuild their lives. No, I don't have no idea what to do from there. Jamie Kellingsworth, First News, Prince Albert. Several agencies are working tonight to help those people left homeless by the fire. As Wayne Paskaruk reports, volunteers worked quickly to get the relief effort underway. Many organizations banded together to find shelter and comfort for those left homeless. The Red Cross, Share a Meal, the Salvation Army, just a few. There were between 40 and 50 apartments, and numbers of people we think could be right around the 200 mark that have been displaced. But it doesn't stop there necessarily. It's looking like uh, people who live in homes near the building are also going to be out of their homes tonight. Well over 100 people in a matter of a couple of hours were preparing food, driving, assisting in any way they can. It's amazing. Everybody has worked really hard 
in just a few hours and have come together and everyone has said so far, we're here till the bitter end, we're here till we need to be, give us a call, we're ready with this, that, or another thing. You've got St. George's is in there, um, you've got friend at Sheremeal in at the Red Cross, registration was being taken for those seeking shelter. Once we've registered them, this helps people, family members who are looking for people who live there to track down where they are. We want to make sure that, that um, people are, are comfortable. It seems that they want to stay fairly close to the downtown core. This is their home. They have lost everything. Share a meal food bank was also preparing, mainly supplying food and drink. Anybody who needs to, uh, you know, shelter from the cold and who needs food and this sort of stuff can come down to share a meal. We're prepared to stay open all night. Some say if there is a bright note to this story, it is that of the citizens of Prince Albert who came together so quickly in an hour of need. For First News, I'm Wayne Pascarut. As you just saw in that last story, relief organizations were pushed to the limit tonight and so were city fire and rescue crews. Joni Nicolo reports. When fire had fully engulfed the building, the fire department's priority was to protect the outside of the apartment and to contain the fire to the inside. It's uh, certainly uh, gone up a lot quicker than we expected. You know, uh, these old structures like this, a lot of wood construction in them, and, and certainly once it gets going, there you have little hope of ever saving it. Almost every member of the fire department was on the scene. While the fire was taxing on the crew, it was equally as taxing on the city's water system. They've got all the pressure they can give us down there now. We're at the point where we shut off a line. We have to notify the water treatment plant because we could rupture the whole uh, water main system. We, uh, because the, the sparks from the, are floating around the area, we have the uh, volunteers from Buckland and from West Central in here just patrolling the area. Fire crews expect to be on the scene all night and well into tomorrow. For now, the main concern is to keep the fire contained within the apartment walls and hope the building doesn't collapse onto a house. Uh, as you see on this one here, it's got a lot of cross structure of brick, and hopefully that's going to contain it and hold it uh, so that the outer walls don't give on us. At last word, the fire was only flaring in spots, and the walls were intact. But fire crews will remain on the scene and continue to monitor what's left of Harp Hill Apartments. Joni Nicolo, First News, Prince Albert. Turning to other news now, don't expect any new police officers in Prince Albert in the near future. That's the message from the Board of Police Commissioners. The board met for the first time since the Prince Albert Police Association went public with concerns they were understaffed. As Jamie Killingsworth reports, the board says the Police Association is being unrealistic. This Prince Albert City police officer probably won't be working with any new officers anytime soon but he may see more of his colleagues on the street. The Board of Police Commissioners has been trying to find ways to free up more officers to fight crime. The board had been working on their plans months before the police association went public with charges of understaffing. It is a pre-budget um, uh, public relations campaign and uh, I simply am not going to bend to a special interest group uh, in order to raise taxes and uh, that's final. The board is looking at hiring security officers to take care of courtroom security. They also want to find other ways of serving documents, a task presently done by police. We're going to do what we have to do with the dollars at our exposal, disposal. The taxpayers need to be protected. That also means no new officers. More officers will not cure the crime problem within the city of Prince Albert. Uh, more officers do not stop crimes from happening. All more officers will do uh, is allow a few more crimes to be solved after they have happened. If the Board of Police Commissioners has its way, money will be spent freeing up officers to fight crime, not hiring new ones. However, the Board's recommendations will go to City Council as part of the 1993 budget debate, where the whole issue could be fought all over again. Jamie Kellingsworth, First News, Prince Albert. Also discussed at today's Board of Police Commissioners meeting was a request by the Mobile Crisis Unit for greater funding from the city. The center would like to hire an additional sexual assault worker and increase services. Employees at the Mobile Crisis Center say the work they do can help an overworked police department. The unit wants an increase in funding of over $6,000 to over $28,000.
an amount that would increase the city's portion of funding to the center to only 9%, still far less than centers in Regina and Saskatoon receive. A lot of preventive things, we get a lot of calls, you know, that we get um, before they get to the stage where the police might get them. And I think that's one of the things, the key areas that hasn't really been looked at in the past. The future of high school education in Saskatchewan is under review. A committee is touring the province and getting input from educational institutions. Today, the committee was in Prince Albert. Joni Nicolo reports. This panel is reviewing high school education in Prince Albert. The committee hears from education representatives all over the province. It's determining if high schools are meeting the needs of students and preparing them for the future. We're here to clarify and, and uh, be sure we understand what your thoughts are that you presented in your brief. Shirley Gange is presenting a brief on behalf of Carleton Comprehensive High School. One of her suggestions is to pay more attention to career education. If we could persuade someone to let us take control as a community, maybe one of the things we could do, and we're recommending this, is have a common school year for grade 10. A school year that does give students the opportunity to be exposed to a variety of subjects. We'd be able to conclude career education in that particular option, and the students would be more mature. Gann says high school should provide more than just academics. I'd like to think that our students through a career education would be exposed to not only the job options that are available out there, but what sort of skills do you need to survive in the world? What kind of life do you want? At Carleton, some students felt more attention should be given to study skills. Especially in grade 12, they should have something to do with study skills because no one really knows how to study very well. I think we could do a better job with study skills. We're so heavily content driven. It's input like this that the committee is looking for. It will prepare a report after it's toured the province and then present it to the government. Joni Nicolo, First News, Prince Albert. Well, it's Education Week in Saskatchewan, and special events are being held in the Gateway Mall in Prince Albert to mark the occasion. All of the schools in the city have put up displays in the mall, and there is entertainment as well. This afternoon, the senior band from Riverside School kept shoppers' toes tapping. The education displays and activities will continue at the mall for the rest of the week. It was a special day for a group of Prince Albert area residents. 52 individuals were presented with awards marking the 125th anniversary of Canadian Confederation. Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Fedoric was in Prince Albert to honor the area's most giving citizens. The Saskatchewan 125 Volunteer Award was presented, as well as the Canada 125 Commemorative Medal. The national award was presented to individuals in recognition of their contribution to their fellow citizens, the community, and the country. Recipients of the award included local politicians and community leaders, including Prince Albert Television General Manager Dennis Dunlop. Ladies and gentlemen, today should be a very proud day, not only for the medal recipients, but also for their family and their friends who have lent them support and encouragement. It's an opportunity for our country, Canada, to express its appreciation in a lasting way to those who've done so much for Canada and for Canadians. Coming up in the weather, more flurries in the forecast. Stay with us. Considerable cloud and flurry activity dominated the province today. It looks like that sort of thing is going to continue right up until Saturday. And along with those flurries, things are going to cool off a little bit. Today we had a high of minus 6 and a low this morning of minus 11. We had 0.4 millimeters of precipitation today. Of course, that was all snow. The normals for this time of year, a high of minus 5 and a low of minus 18. So we're actually a little bit below normal for our high. Taking a look at the Prairie Satellite Map tonight, you can see there's a high pressure system dominate, or, uh, developing in northern Saskatchewan, and that's expected to move southward uh, as the days go on, clearing skies over, but then another disturbance from in Alberta will move in uh, probably by Monday, bringing us a chance of even more flurries. Temperatures at this hour across the region, Edmonton is minus 3, it's minus 6 in Calgary, Regina is minus 8 with a light snow shower at this hour, and Winnipeg is minus 11. Currently around our region of the province, La Ronge is the cool spot on the Saskatchewan map at minus 15. It's minus 10 in Nipawin and Spiritwood. Melfort is minus 9. Hudson Bay minus 11. 
and Saskatoon reporting minus 8. Currently in North Battleford, it's uh, a few clouds in the area. The temperature is minus 9. The wind is out of the northwest at uh, out of the north rather at 17 kilometers an hour. The RH is 83 percent and the pressure is 104.0 and that's holding steady. Here in Prince Albert, we're under a cloudy sky and it's minus 9. The wind is out of the north at 19 kilometers an hour, gusting up to 30 at times. The RH is 68 percent and the pressure is holding steady at 103.9. The forecast now for the Prince Albert area. Tonight is calling for isolated flurries with some clearing overnight, and because of that clearing, the temperature is going to dip down to around minus 20. Winds will be out of the northwest at around 20, bringing wind chills up to around 1600. For tomorrow, we're looking for sunny skies with some cloud in the afternoon. Around 8 o'clock, it should be minus 20. Minus 12 by lunchtime and climbing to our forecast high of minus 7 by 4 o'clock. Winds will be light and they will be variable. Taking a look now at the three-day outlook. For Saturday, it looks like cloudy skies and a 70% chance of snow flurries, a high of minus 5 and a low of minus 18. For Sunday, sunny skies, a high of minus 6 and a low that night of minus 20. And the cool trend continues on Monday under cloudy skies, a high of minus 6 and a low of minus 19. Coming up in sports, a golden day for Canada at the World Figure Skating Championship. Welcome back. Bob is here with sports. And Bob, you're going to start things off tonight in the NHL. Yeah, and uh, specifically NHL in Saskatchewan, something we would like to hear, mm -hmm. Sean. Good evening, everyone. The NHL was back at Sask Place for the final time this season. And of the four matchups awarded Saskatchewan Place, this one was clearly the best. The Minnesota North Stars were up against the Vancouver Canucks. Both teams had star quality, the Canucks with Pavel Bure and the Stars with former Raider Mike Medano. And as a result, a sellout card of over 12,000 was in attendance. We'll pick it up in the first period. The Canucks will strike first. Yuri Slager will rip one by John Casey from the point. Canucks up 1-0. Moving to the second game, tied at 1. Canucks on the 2-on-1. -on -one. Trevor Linden finishes. Canucks regain a 2-1 lead. Game tied at 2 in the second. Dave Gagne with a great individual effort, splitting the D and then beating Kay Whitmore between the pads. Stars up 3-2. The folks were out to see Bure tonight, but he gets tossed after this accidental high stick cuts Stu Gavin in the second. Gavin looking uh, a little bit bad. They're getting the blood goes off his lip. Bure gets the heave hole of the North Stars. Defeat the Canucks the final 4-3. Dave Gagne with two. Mike Medano and Russ Courtnell with singles. Linden, Cron, and Slager for the Canucks. 12,006 in attendance that have sold out Sask Place this evening. Tonight in Boston, the Bruins in Montreal. Jacques Lemaire once again behind the Habs bench, and he didn't like what he saw early. Peter Durst in the first minute bangs it by Andre Rassico. 1-0 Bruins. Former Raider Darren Kimball gets in on the action as he banks it in off Stefan LeBeau. 2 0 Bruins. Still in the first, Dimitri Fartal off puts the weak backhand by Rossico. 3 0 Beantown. Rossico did not see the end of this one as he was pulled for former Raider Fred Shabbat and he was victimized as well. Fartal off. That's his second of the night out of the air off to Steve Leach feed Boston. No problem tonight knocking off the Canadians there. You see the final. Meanwhile, Jacques Demers will be back behind the Canadians bench on Saturday when they will take on the Quebec Nordiques. Tonight in Pittsburgh, it was Lemieux versus Gretzky. It's the 18th time these two have met. one nothing Kings in the first. Lemieux to Yager, he buries it game tied at one. Then it's Yager busting in. He tries to deke Rob Stauber, but Stauber comes up with the big pad save to keep the game tied at one. Penn's now on the power play. Alf Samuelson to Joey Mullen. He will make the move on Stauber and get the goal. Penn's up 2-1. to one. Second period, Gretzky gets into the act, putting in a Tony Granato feed game tied at 2. The game goes to overtime tied at 3. Larry Murphy shoots. Yager tips it in. Pittsburgh knocks off the Kings 4-3 in overtime. Yager with two goals, including the winner. Mario, a great night for him. A goal and three assists for the four-point outing. Luke Robitaille, his 49th in a losing cause for the Kings. To the scoreboard we go. Gary Galley with two goals and two assists. Mark Recchi with a pair of goals as well as Philadelphia knocks off the Capitals 6-4. Washington has won just one of their last seven games. The Rangers get three third period goals. They knock off the Blackhawks in Chicago. The final there 4-1. Jeff Brown had two goals. Brett Hull a goal and two assists. St. Louis knocks off San Jose. The final 5-2. And this game just in a final score. There you see it. Calgary Knocked off Detroit 6-3, the Flames. Now five back of the first place Canucks in the Smythe Division. Well, no hockey action in junior circles tonight, but things will heat up tomorrow at the Communiplex. The Raiders will put their season on the line at home against Medicine Hat. 
The Tigers enter tomorrow's contest five points up on the Raiders for seventh, and a win for the Tigers would all but mathematically eliminate the Raiders from the playoff race. Speaking of the playoffs, the first round matchup in the SJHL has been decided. First place, Melford will take on fourth place, Nippon. There you see the games. They will start Tuesday, March the 16th at the Palace. Game 2, Wednesday, March 17th in Nippon. Game 3, Thursday, March 18th in Melford. And they will play four and four nights as Game 4 goes Friday, March the, 10th, March the 19th in Nippon. If necessary, back to the Palace Tuesday, March the 23rd. Wednesday, the 24th, if a Game 6 is necessary in Nippon. And Friday, the 26th of March, if the, that series should go to a seventh and deciding game. Meanwhile, the NSJHL final resumes tomorrow night in Canistano. Game 2 of the best of seven series, the Tigers host Saskatoon. The Tigers leading that series one to nothing. Well, there was plenty on the line tonight at the Labatt Briar in Ottawa. In this evening's feature game, Regina's Randy Wojtowicz battled Rick Folk formerly of Saskatoon and now from Kelowna. Both teams came in at 6-3, and three, and for the loser, a shot at the playoffs would be slid. Pick it up in the fourth end, BC up 2-1, to one, and with last rock advantage, Folk facing two Saskatchewan counters. He pulls the string, coming up light. Wojtowicz grabs a steal of two and a 3-2 lead. Folk comes back in the fourth end. He's looking for a hit and stick for a deuce. He gets the hit, rolls just a little for drama's sake, and regains a 4-3 lead. Wojtowicz picks up a single in the fifth, and it's tied at four in the sixth. Wojtowicz with his final stone will miss the takeout. That gives Folk a free draw for two and it's 6-4 BC after six. More trouble for the Saskatchewan skip as we move to the seventh. With his final stone, he is trying to make the hit to count at least one, but he shakes everything up a bit too much. Folk grabs a steal of two and a commanding 8-4 lead after seven. Wojtowicz picks up one in the eighth, so he trails 8-5 in the ninth without last rock, but he gets a big break with his final rock of the ninth Folk gasses the open hit and gives up a steal of two. 8-7 BC coming home. But Lightning doesn't strike twice for Wojtowicz. Folk makes the open hit in the 10th with his final stone to count a 9-7 win. A crucial victory for British Columbia. Tough loss for Saskatchewan. There you see the final score in tonight's other game of importance. Ontario's Russ Howard knocks off Alberta at 9-4. So we check out the standings. This is what it looks like. Northern Ontario and Ontario are done. Rick Lang and Russ Howard are in the playoffs for sure. Meanwhile, Manitoba at 7-3 and three still has a shot, as does BC. Saskatchewan plays Newfoundland tomorrow. Saskatchewan needs BC and Manitoba to lose tomorrow, and they must beat Newfoundland to have a shot at the playoffs. Canada is back on top of the world when it comes to men's figure skating. It was 1-2 for our country at the Worlds in Prague today. Kurt Browning won his fourth world title at Prague. Browning was first entering today's free skate, and he refused to let the gold medal slip away producing a great performance to the music of Casablanca. Meanwhile, fellow Canadian Elvis Stoichel made up for a terrible day yesterday as he captured the silver medal after entering the free skate in fifth position. So a great day for Canada at the Worlds in Prague. Browning won, Stoichel two. Great performance by Kurt Browning tonight. Certainly. Just uh, recapping our top story this evening, the Harp Hill apartment block near downtown Prince Albert went up in flames today. There is uh, still no word on fatalities. However, several people were injured uh, fire crew is still working at this hour to uh, bring that fire uh, under control. Relief agencies, of course, working this evening, and uh, we'll continue to follow this story tomorrow for you on First News. Good night. Have a pleasant evening.